Welcome back, listeners, to Sandman Stories Presents, a folklore podcast where I read you to sleep or until the next story. I'm your host, Dustin. If my voice sounds a little bit gruff, you can thank the Canadian wildfires. Today we are back in the book of Korean fairy tales written down by W.E. Griffiths. This story is about a stingy businessman who learns what it is to be like a cow. It's a long one, so let's begin. Old Timber Top The fairies in the Korean province of Gangwon, which means River Meadow, were having great fun when one of their number told how they played a trick on an old ox driver they called Old Timber Top. How he got such a strange name, this story will tell. This driver was a rich and stingy fellow who had made a fortune in lumber. He used to buy up all the trees he could. Then he would have them cut down and sawed into logs and boards. His men would haul them away in their rough carts drawn by stout bulls to his lumber yard. In wintertime, sleds were used. But whether it was the season of ice and snow or of tree blossoms and flowers, the animal used to draw sleds or carts was always a bull. For in Korea, horses or donkeys do not know how to pull anything. The ponies and donkeys are too small. And not being used to the work, if harnessed, they would kick the wagon all to pieces. They can carry loads on their backs, but the bulls can do this also. So the creature with horns is considered to be the most valuable of beasts of burden. Besides, he fills the purse and makes good dinners when his owner is through with him. You can see these patient carriers loaded so high with brushwood or piled sticks that they seem to be carrying small mountains of twigs, grass, and leaves for kindlings, or with heavy logs of wood for fuel. Yet when the bull is very young, a mere baby, he has a happier time than a colt or a little donkey, for he lives in the house and is the children's pet. Old Timbertop sold his logs and boards at such high prices that the poor suffered. This was because they were cold and could not afford to pay so many strings of cash for fuel. The people used to say that the old fellow would skin a mosquito for his hide and tallow, so sometimes they gave him the nickname of Skinflay. Not many of the villagers were able to buy planks of wood, thick and heavy and strong enough to keep the pigs safe from the tigers, which came down from the mountains and prowled about at night in the villages. These long-haired and black-striped beasts got to be so fond of pork that they would, even in the snow, without fearing the cold or the guns of the hunters, claw up to the tops of the pens and get down among the squealing prey. They might get a baby pig at once or, perhaps, drag out and carry off enough of a big porker to feed their cubs for a week. All the stables and cowhouses had to be made of very strong, for the tigers, when they had gone a good while without food, seemed to be hungry enough to eat a horse, harness and all, and even a grown-up cow or ox. Yet as a rule, no tiger cared to taste either beef or horse meat if he could get young pork or veal. Old Timbertop was not satisfied only making money at his lumberyard. It is the custom in Korea to plant the most beautiful trees around tombs or in the cemeteries. When this skin flint heard of a family which had become so poor that they needed to sell the splendid trees which had been planted around their ancestors' graves, he sent his agents to buy the timber. These fellows would load up a horse with long ropes of copper and iron cash, coins that had a square hole in the middle and were strung together with twine made of twisted straw. It was a heavy horse load to carry twenty dollars worth of coin. Arriving on the spot, After beating the owner down to the lowest price possible, Old Timbertop's men would go out, chop down and saw up the grand trees, leaving only the sawdust on the graves, while the people wept to lose what they loved. In this way the landscape was spoiled, and this made many villagers very angry at such a man, for the Koreans love natural scenery and almost worship fine trees, which had made their country beautiful for centuries. But what did Old Timbertop care? provided he could pile up his strings of cash and jingle his silver. In time, this hard old fellow could think of nothing else but how to get richer out of the wants and sufferings of other people. The wealthier he became, the more he wanted. Yet he did not get any happier. Nobody loved him, while many hated him. At last, he thought he would make a trip to Seoul, the great capital city which every Korean hopes to see sometime. 
There he expected to receive honor and appointment to rank and office. Timbertop had a relative who was high in the king's service, who, he thought, would assist him, for all Koreans are kind and helpful to each other, especially when they are related. To be an officer, Timbertop knew would permit him even to wear the gorgeously shining mandarin's hat with wide flaps or wings on it, and a long white silk coat with a big square on the breast of velvet or satin, embroidered with starks or dragons, clouds and waves. When he went out on the streets, he could strut about as if he were the lord of the universe, for he would then wear a hat so high and with such a round, wide brim that he would not dare to go out during the high wind, for fear of being blown away, like a ship in a tempest. In such a costume, he would be saluted by servants and common people, who would bow down before him, because they would think him a great man. But how could he win such a position and gain the glory of it? He was not a scholar learned in books, or in law, or a doctor of medicine. Not being a soldier either, he knew nothing of war. He could not ride on a monocycle as the general did, drawn or pushed by four men and dressed in long red coat studded all over with shining metal with brass helmet on his head, on the top of which was a little dragon. He feared, even if he were appointed, he might fall off the one-wheeled vehicle and show what a fool he was. Nevertheless, this old fool was so vain and full of conceit that he followed what was once common custom in Korea. He took his long journey to Seoul, leaving his family behind, to live on the cheapest kind of kimchi with turnips and millet. Now the Koreans are all famous for giving welcome and showing hospitality to their poor relations, and often they do this even to tramps and lazy people. When a man becomes rich or holds high office, he usually has around him many hangers-on. Some we should even say were loafers. So on arriving to Seoul, Old Timbertop took up his quarters in one part of his relative's big house. There he lived a long time and was treated decently, for he was always saying soft things and making flattering speeches to his host. In fact, he bowed down like a slave when in the presence of his august master. Yet in truth, he was despised even by the servants and workpeople. In order to not wear out his welcome entirely, he had to make from time to time a handsome present to his patron. This steadily reduced both his income and his fortune. While these were shrinking, his family at home suffered, so that by and by he received notice by letter that his business had dried up and soon no more money could be sent to him in Seoul. While he lingered, news from home grew worse and worse. His wife was obliged to sell their house to pay debts. The next item was that she and her daughter were living in a wretched shanty at the end of the village and were no longer in society. All this time, those in Seoul, who knew that the foolish fellow was as ambitious as ever to wear the fine white clothes of a scholar or the gay colors of a soldier, declared that old Timbertop had no brains. They even jested about a pumpkin set on their shoulders or they laughed when they declared that the wood, which he had sold for so long, had gone to his head. They debated in the wine shops whether, if his skull were opened, pumpkin seeds or timber would be found inside of it. So they also called him Old Timbertop, meaning that his skull was a wooden head, and no better than that of an idol carved out of persimmon wood, which were so plentiful in the Buddhist temples. Others declared that he had a real head of bone and brains, but he carried it under his armpits, as the saying was. When the fairies heard this, they unanimously resolved to reform the old fellow, even if they had to make an ox out of him. Timbertop, now poor and bankrupt, knew that he must leave Seoul and go home and work for a living. When he made his final call on his rich soul relative and told him he must, to his great regret, take his leave and go back to his native village, he was not well received. Being too poor to buy a present to give to his host, on whose bounty he had lived for so long, he was answered coldly and told to go and do as he liked. And this, after years of fawning and gift-making, not a word of thanks or appreciation. Poor Timbertop was down in the mouth, and his heart was cold in his bosom. He knocked on his head with his fists to find out, after all, if it had really turned into timber. On his way back, a big storm came on, and when he came to a village inn, cold and wet and hungry, he begged for shelter overnight. The woman who kept it was the wife of a butcher, who was then away from home. This was an awful blow to Timbertop's pride, for butchers were held to be the lowest of people, and they were not even allowed to wear hats like the rest of the men in Korea. 
The woman was kind to the stranger. She gave him a hot supper and let him sleep in that room of the house which had the best stone floor, under which the flues from the kitchen fire ran. So he warmed himself and baked his clothes, which were sopping wet, until they were dry. He was so tired that he kept on sleeping till very late the next morning, and nearly to the noon hour. He was altogether so comfortable that it seemed to him as if he were a great man in the capital, thus to receive such kind treatment. Waking up from one of his naps, he heard what he thought was the big butcher, who had come home, asking his wife in a gruff tone of voice, Where is that ox? I must sell him this morning, for it is market day, he said. In less than a minute or more, the man and his wife entered the room with four sticks, which the fairies had put there, a halter, and a rope made of twisted rice straw, besides a thick iron ring, such as they put into bulls' noses to make them obey their masters. Throwing down the iron ring and rope on the floor, in a trice they had thrust the stick under old Timbertop's back. In a moment more, he felt horns growing out of his head, and his lips becoming thick as sausages. His mouth was as wide as a saucer, and had big teeth growing on the upper jaw. A tail sprouted from his other end, and the four sticks became four legs. Before he could quite understand just what was going on, or what the matter could be, old Timbertop was standing on four legs, and the butcher was slipping the ring through his nose. Oh, how it did hurt! It was an awkward job to get the animal out of the room and through the narrow door, and some of the paper on the walls and the furniture suffered. But finally, when out in the open air, the bull, that was no other than what had been the old man Timbertop, went quietly along to the marketplace. Any attempt to pull his head away, or to stop and run off, or in any way misbehave, hurt his nose so dreadfully that he quickly quit. The butcher needed to give only a slight jerk of the rope when the bull changed his gait, and was as quiet as a lamb. Even though the animal was big enough to gore the man and toss him on its horns and crush him by trampling on him with his hoof if once he got angry. One would have supposed that Timbertop would be the fighting bull, but no. In the marketplace he stood patiently and quietly for hours, hardly even stamping when the flies began to bite. Oh, that I had been as diligent and kept on at my honest occupation in my native village as that fly, mused the bull, that still had a man's memory. At last there came a man with money to buy. He was a drover who unloaded his pony and paid down many strings, about twenty pounds of copper and iron cash. The owner put the halter in the buyer's hand, and the new master then led off Timbertop to be sold to a butcher who lived in his hometown up in the north. This fellow intended first to fatten the animal, and then turn him into steaks and stewing meat. But on his way, the new owner thought that, because he had made a good bargain, he must stop at a wine shop and have a drink. So he tied Timbertop's nose with a rope to the low wall, which enclosed a turnip field, and went inside the shop. But while the drover's wine went in, his wits went out, and he fell asleep and stayed in the shop a long time. In fact, it was as the old song said, First the man takes a dram, then the dram takes another dram, then the dram takes the man. Meanwhile, Timbertop looked over the low wall, and yielding to temptation, pulled up with his teeth some of the plants by the roots, first chewing the green leaves, and then grinding the turnips and swallowing them. Presto! The horns drew in and shriveled up, the nose ring dropped out of his nose, and fell with a crash on the stones of the village path. His two forelegs turned into arms. The hair and hoofs became human legs and old Timbertop was a man and himself once again. To make sure of it, he felt himself all over, pulled his own nose, felt around back to see if he had a tail, and rubbed his head for horns. None there. He looked down and found he had only two legs. Then he swung his arms with delight, at once more being a man. Well named, turn up you, he mused. You green plant with a mustard-like taste. You have turned me inside out. Or have the fairies been busy? He had hardly got these ideas through his half-wooden head, that he was on two legs and a man once more and could think like one. Then he started on the road home. Just then the drover rushed out of the wine shop and accosted him, saying, Have you seen a stray bull anywhere near this place? Of course, Timbertop, using fine language like a yangban, 
said that there was no bull that he could have seen or know of, and he had heard none bellowing. Then he gave the driver a look of contempt for being so stupid and for asking him, a gentleman, such a foolish question. Yet after he was out of sight, the drover slapped his thighs, as Koreans do when they are amused at their own smartness, and went on joyfully. He just kept on repeating to himself, Sticks and turnips, sticks and turnips. Then a big idea struck him, as if it were the tap on a wooden drum, such as one sees in the Buddhist temples. It hit his brain so hard and swelled his head that his big Korean hat nearly toppled off. Immediately, he put this idea into action. He returned hastily to the inn and into the room which he had been turned into a bull and stole the butcher's four fairy sticks which stood in a corner. Then he raced at once over to the roads towards the capital. Reaching Seoul, he went to the house of his rich relative, where he had waited ten years for the fortune and favor which did not come. Going into his host's bedroom, he tapped the high lord of the house with the four fairy sticks, not hardly, but only lightly. Forthwith the man's head became horns on the top, with a muzzle of thick lips in front. His hands turned into front hoofs and his legs turned into the hindquarters of a bull. Yet he was not entirely an ox, only half an animal and half man. Old Timbertop stopped tapping and then went away, to await events, leaving the creature half man and half ox. He knew soon that he would be called in. When the family of a wife, many sons, several daughters, servants, retainers, hangers-on, and what not, saw their master, half man and half ox, with horns and hoofs, they were distracted. Each one had his own notion of how to get him back into human form, like his former self. Each one ran all over town and into the adjoining villages to get and call in the mudangs. These mudangs were the people, mostly women, whose business it was to drive out the imps and bad fairies, such as had, in this case, done the mischief. The kitchen maids stoutly declared that Tokebi had wrought the change upon their master. They felt quite sure of it. But the men thought the gods of the mountains were punishing him for his sins. On the other hand, the mudang woman said she would find out and get him back into his human skin if they paid her enough money. With drums and dancing and songs, screams, yells, and every sort of noise, the mudangs kept up such a terrible racket that it almost deafened the family. There were several of them called in, and they knew that they would all be paid very well. Meanwhile, the doctors also kept on with their awful medicines, besides rubbing, pounding, blowing, and sticking needles into the bull, or burning moxa, or little balls of cottony mugwort on its hide. Yet not a hoof or horn, not even a hair, changed. The mudangs declared that the imps had got inside the man, and they must get them out. One fellow carried a big bottle to trap the imps and cork them in. Another insisted that they would have to use scissors and snip the skin in about a hundred places, thus making holes to let the evil creatures out. Then they must bottle them up, lest they should get out and overrun the house and would infest the whole town. There seemed not so many chances of getting well as one hare among nine oxen, but the wife pleaded that they would put off using the scissors until all of the means had failed. She did not want to see her dear husband's skin made into a colander or a sieve if that could be helped. At this point, when the din and the despair were the worst, and had come to a climax, old Timbertop appeared. As some of the family had collapsed and lay helpless on the floor, and as they were all too tired to ask questions, they at once made way for him. After looking at the patient with a face as wise as an owl's, old Timbertop solemnly announced that only one thing could save him, and that was a rare and wonderful drug, of which only he knew the secret but which he could speedily procure. Of course the wife, sons, and daughters instantly promised to give up their all to see their husband and father himself again. So while Timbertop went out to get the famous medicine, they all fell asleep, tired out, while the oxman lay over on his side resting his horns and hoofs in the floor bed. For in Korea they do not have bedsteads, that is, beds raised up from the floor. As for old Timbertop, once out on the street, he immediately began saying to himself over and over again, Turnips and sticks, sticks and turnips. Going to a vegetable shop, he bought a fine large turnip, or turnip radish, the kind that grows in Korea, silvery white and about four feet long. At first he peeled, then sliced, and finally pounded it into a sauce very fine. Then entering the house in triumph, 
he woke up the doctors, kicked the servants awake, and announced that the potent drug would soon restore their master. He solemnly bade them all to watch and see him do it. Pulling and hauling all together, five or six fellows were able to get the man bull on his two hoofs and two feet, and then Timbertop put a spoonful of the sauce on the big tongue. At once a most marvelous change took place. The horns shortened until they disappeared, the lips thinned, the mouth became smaller, hoofs and hair and hide departed into empty air. In the wagging of a dog's tail, the mighty man of the house had become himself again. All the doctors, jugglers, and mudangs packed up their imp bottles and medicines, and with their drums, flutes, bags, boxes, and wares, slunk away, while the family loaded old Timbertop with grateful thanks and compliments. As for the master, he declared Timbertop the greatest physician the world ever knew. He invited him to make his house his permanent home, and showered upon him with many gifts, with plenty to eat, and white clothes starched as white as the snow. The hats with which he presented Timbertop were so big around, and had a brim so wide, that he used them when covered with oil paper covers as umbrellas in the rainy weather. But he never went out of doors when the wind was blowing for fear he would be whirled down the street. Besides this, he feared that there was still much wood in his head, which might turn into a top and spin around if he were not careful. Old Timbertop set up a medicine office, practiced among the nobility, and became physician to the king. When he visited the palace, he used a red visiting card a foot long. He had a plastron, or a square of velvet embroidery, on his breast. He wore a string of amber beads as big as walnuts over his ears. He soon became fat with a double chin and plump fingers, showing that he reeked with prosperity. He lived to a good old age, his family were made comfortable, his sons and daughters married well, and he had seventeen grandchildren before he died. Yet all the time the fairies claimed that they did it all. They made the sticks work one way, and the turnips another, and they still play their tricks on the Koreans, especially those with more or less wood in their heads. The End Well, that was a heck of a story. I've seen shorter versions of it where a boy gets a magical cow mask and wants to be lazy, but then he becomes a cow. I like how old Timbertop thought of, oh, you know, I shouldn't have been so cruel when he was a cow. It was good to see him get turned around. I don't like the little asides made by the author about how silly Koreans act. I kind of feel his judgment every time he writes about the people. Still, good story, and I miss Korea. And the podcast shout out is to the Tabby Tabby podcast. This is a very cool podcast that covers myths and legends and general spooky stuff from the Philippines. The host, Ethan, has a lot of passion for sharing her culture with the wider English speaking world. She pulls from all sorts of resources and is a great resource herself. And if you like her podcast as much as I do, go and give her a listen, a rating, and a review. And the listener shout out is to the city of Dusseldorf. Dussel comes from the river of the same name and probably just means roar, and Dorf is just a village. So, a village on the Dussel River. It is also not far from the city of Essen where someone in my family lived a hundred plus years ago. So to my wonderful listeners in Dusseldorf, I say, Dankeschön und guten Nacht. Thank you and good night. <laughs>